Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Heat Recovery Ventilation in Winter High Tunnels. My name is Chris Lent, and I'm an agricultural specialist at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, more commonly known as NCAT. NCAT is a nationwide nonprofit organization with six regional headquarters in the country. We work on issues pertaining to sustainable agriculture, sustainable energy, and sustainable communities. Today's webinar will focus on a project that looked at the use of heat recovery ventilation in winter high tunnel production here in the Northeast. It's being sponsored by a Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Partnership Grant that funded NCAT in partnership with New Morning Farm. So thank you very much to Northeast SARE for funding this work and thank you to New Morning Farm where the project work took place and where I worked with New Morning Farm's field manager, Pearl Weatherall, to implement the project. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCAT's ATRA webpage, www.ncat.atra.org. There's a feature on the page, Ask an Ag Ex Expert, and send emails with any questions you may have or you might want to call our Sustainable Ag Helpline number, 800-345-9140. We welcome your questions on any Sustainable Ag subjects, not just today's webinar, and it's worth mentioning that it is a free service. So I want to get right into a description of what the project uh, actually was that we worked on here. It's a project, uh, and I considered it a pilot project because I think more work needs to be done in this realm. But uh, for this project, I propose to test if the use of a heat recovery ventilator to ventilate high tunnels during winter crop production would effectively increase the average daily temperature in a high tunnel. And as a result of that, would it increase the crop production and profitability uh, for winter growers? Uh, so this project tested that idea, and in, in the late summer of 2015, we set up a heat recovery ventilation uh, equipment in one high tunnel, we called the lower high tunnel, on New Morning Farm, and used another identical high tunnel as a control. Uh, we took data samples from both tunnels over the course of the winter growing season on temperature and humidity, and also used crop production records out of those tunnels. And we analyzed that data to determine uh, whether we actually did achieve any of the goals of the project. Uh, we used the harvest records to determine if new ventilation systems, if the new ventilation system affected production and profitability in winter growing. And the findings of the project are to be disseminated through this webinar and which uh, is what we're doing here today. And it's also uh, got an accompanying publication which will be released shortly and uh, describes the entire project and the results of the project. And that will be uh, also available through uh, the ATRA website. I'm hoping that the results can inform Northeast growers on the importance of ventilation in high tunnel winter production and that uh, this really inspires more experimenting with heat recovery ventilation for uh, high tunnels in winter growing here in the Northeast. The, the problem that I saw that, was try, that we tried to address with this project was um, one of the largest problems uh, in growing greens in the wintertime, and that is the ventilating sufficiently in order to lower the relative humidity in the high tunnel enough to prevent or reduce foliar diseases in the tunnel crops. So in an article in uh, Growing for Market that I read in 2014, Ben Hartman wrote uh, about a frozen ground winter growers meeting that, that was put together by Northeast winter growers up here, Sandy and Paul Arnold and Elliot Coleman. I think they organize this winter growers meeting every um, this frozen ground growers meeting every year. Uh, but that year in particular, he wrote about um, proper ventilation that came as one of the main points that came out of the 
conference that year. And it, proper ventilation came up as one of the most important factors to control foliar disease. Uh, the article basically showed that these growers are willing to lose heat on those cold winter days in order to lower the moisture levels in their tunnels. However, we, we know that average lower daily temperatures can really affect crop growth. So to me, uh, it stood to reason that by gaining humidity control, uh, these growers were are reducing their average daily temperatures in their tunnels and reducing production possibly as a result. So if we could come up with a way to reduce humidity without losing heat from the tunnel, uh, it, it may be a, we may be able to control diseases and increase production. So that's kind of the premise that I started on uh, when I wrote the uh, proposal for this project. The possible solution that I came up with was to use a heat recovery ventilator, and here's a diagram of, of a heat recovery heat recovery ventilator uh, that I'll describe to you here. But I thought this might be one possible solution. I have a uh, background in residential energy efficiency, and because excess moisture in a home can lead to mold and safety issues for people living in that home, uh, heat recovery ventilators uh, are installed many times in that situation to re reduce moisture problems without losing the heat from the home. And it seemed to me a comparable to the problems that these growers were having in their high tunnels. So I thought, why not try to use a heat recovery ventilator? And I, I looked into it and I've seen that they have been used sometimes in greenhouse production, but I never saw them used in high tunnel winter growing. So I thought it might be a good experiment. The diagram that you see shows stale, humid, hot air coming in from the high tunnel in the bottom right-hand uh, corner of the recovery uh, unit. And that runs through a heat exchanger, which is the heat recovery cube in the middle. Those are made out of aluminum most times. Uh, very simple technology. And then uh, the stale, humid, cool air goes to the outside and fresh cold air is drawn in from the inside and that runs through the heat exchanger as well. And the warm air coming from the inside of the tunnel transfers heat to the cool air coming in from the outside of the tunnel. And what you end up is I end up with is fresh, warm, dry air going into uh, the tunnel or the house. So that's basically how they work. They're very simple technology and there's a couple of fans that are running uh, that, that move the air and a very simple heat exchanger in the middle. Uh, that's a basic diagram on how they work. The main questions that I tried, that I put forth to try to answer with this project were, can uh, the heat exchanger actually keep relative humidity below 85% in winter production in a high tunnel? And I chose the 85% um, as a threshold because a lot of foliar diseases kick in at or above 85% relative humidity. So it looked like that was a good, that would be a good threshold to try to meet. Uh, the question two is, will the high tunnel uh, being ventilated with the heat exchanger in cold weather have a higher average daily temperature as a result of the use of the new ventilation system? Um, that was the second question I wanted to answer. The third was, if we do have a higher daily temperature, um, will that increase crop growth? And uh, subsequently, uh, how much will it increase crop growth? And then the last question was, if we did get increased daily average daily temperatures and we got increased crop growth, was it significant enough to actually justify the costs of the heat recovery ventilation system? So those are the questions we're going to look at here today. I'm also going to run you through uh, the installation process to show you some of the specifics there. Um, and then we're going to talk about the um, talk about the data that we collected and uh, and the results of the project. The methods of the project, some of the basic methods that I used were we used two tunnels, like I like I said, one they were both 20 feet by 96 feet long. Uh, one was 
had the HR V or heat recovery ventilation system installed in it, and the other didn't, and it was used as a control. Um, we prepared uh, and planted both tunnels in exactly the same way. There were soil tests taken, and the soil was amended to uh, grow, to, to make the soil as good as good as we could for the crops that we were growing. We grew Asian greens and spinach in, in both tunnels, two beds of each in both tunnels. And um, we installed data loggers to collect temperature and humidity data in the tunnels uh, through the entire winter, through 2015 and 16. Uh, and that was the extent of the experiment. So that was kind of the basic setup for the for the experiment or for the project. And this is what the unit looks like installed in the end of the lower high tunnel. It's a not a real large tunnel, but it turns out we could fit the unit pretty comfortably in the gable end inside the tunnel. And we'll talk about how to size these units um, in, the, in the next slide, but uh, this is one of the small this is one of the smaller units on the market this is 100 cfm they make them bigger than this but uh i'll tell you why i went with that in in a in a few minutes here when we talk about sizing uh but you can see the flex ducts that i used going to the outside they're the one the runs along the back of the gable there uh they're insulated flex ducts and it's important that those that are bringing air in from the outside and blowing air to the outside are insulated flex ducts. The return air that is the flex duct that you see running up to the ridge pole in this slide, that does not have to be insulated. And I'll explain why that is in, in a while here as I talk about the installation process. But uh, I'll, go, I'll run through a few slides here with uh, the insulation process and talk about uh, what types of materials I used. Sizing the unit is, is fairly crucial. I was guessing at sizing the unit because this had I had not found any information on how on this being done before or these units being used to ventilate a high tunnel of this size before. But it's all based on the volume of air in the high tunnel. Uh, the units are sized by CFM or cubic feet per minute of air that they can move. And uh, you need to base that sizing on the volume of air that you're trying to move. So uh, first I broke the tunnel into two different sections so it was easy to determine the volume of air in each section and uh, then added those two together. And you can see here I came up with uh, just over 17,000 cubic feet of total air volume inside each of these tunnels. So to size the unit, I was shooting for at least half, one half of an air exchange of the total volume of air per hour in the tunnel. And that was, a, like I said, a little bit arbitrary, but um, it seemed like a good place to start. The, uh, this would mean that every two hours, the entire volume of air in the high tunnel would be exchanged with fresh air. And I felt that that would be a good uh, that would be good enough to try to get most of the humidity out of the out of one of these tunnels. Uh, so in order to get that number, I divided by two, the total air volume, I divided by two, uh, and then divide that whole, that number by 60 minutes. And that ended up being uh, 144 cubic feet per minute is the size unit that I would have needed. Now for budget reasons and for other considerations, I decided to go down to a 100 CFM unit uh, instead of sizing up to a 200 CFM unit. If I had it to do over again, I probably would have recommended to size up to the to the next size up to, um, and it would probably uh, do a little bit better job. Um, but as it was, I chose the 100 CFM unit and you can, we'll see the results here in a little bit. Most of the equipment um, would fit easily on the back of a small pickup pickup truck. You can see all of it here actually on the back of a pickup. 
before it's been taken out of the boxes, I was able to find most of the equipment that I needed um, either online or purchased locally. And I, in this slide, I've broken the equipment down into two different sections and uh, itemized the uh, cost of, of each part of the um, each part of each piece of equipment. The total came out to less than a thousand dollars for this for this size unit, with all of the installation, all of the ductwork, and all of the installation uh, equipment that was needed for that. Which, compared to the type of uh, high value crops that come out of these high tunnels, um, isn't a lot of money. It's still a good chunk of change. And if you were to go with a slightly larger unit, say a 200 CFM unit, you'd be looking at more like $1,200 to $1,500 for, for this kind of an installation. The tools were very simple that are needed to install this kind of equipment. It's a circular saw, a jigsaw, and a screw gun were the only power tools that I really needed. Uh, there were some other basic tools like a hacksaw and a tin snip and some screwdrivers and, uh, of course, a utility knife and then a ladder to actually reach where you need to reach. But very simple tools that can be found on most farms and uh, not a real complicated process. It took about six hours to install the unit. And I will uh, run through some of the installation here. You can see that... Uh, the first step is to put these, place these pieces of plywood in the gable, gable end of the high tunnel. Like I said, this, this isn't a very big tunnel, but we were able to fit this pretty uh, handily in the one gable end of the tunnel. And I think most tum tunnels would be large enough to accommodate uh, these units. I use two by two sheets of plywood here. You can buy them pre-cut at uh, home home centers, uh, or you can cut them out of a larger piece of plywood very easily. I had to uh, trim the corners on these in order to make them fit. And I also had to do a little bit of minor uh, framing and in installed a piece of two by four to hang the inside piece of plywood. So I had something solid to hang that on, but all in all, very little, uh, it was a very small amount of work that I had to do to screw these onto the, uh, onto the gable end of this high tunnel. The plywood that's placed on the inside of the high tunnel is for the heat recovery ventilator to hang on. And this plywood that's placed facing the camera on the outside of the tunnel here in this slide is for the vent hoods themselves. The vent hoods are placed uh, by cutting these circles in into the plywood and then attaching the vent hoods to the plywood. Uh, there's a small metal ductwork behind each vent hood that slides through these holes and then they get screwed to the plywood. And then the plywood, like you saw in the, in the previous slide, gets attached to the greenhouse. Uh, the, the only uh, one thing we did learn with this process is most of these heat recovery ventilation units will have six inch uh, intake and output portals. Uh, the one that I chose had a five inch intake and output portals. And so I needed to find five inch ductwork to match that. And it's harder to find five inch than six inch. So keep that in mind if, if you're ever uh, wanting to experiment with this. We found that uh, the five inch ductwork is a lot harder to find. So the only other thing I would say about the vent hoods and the reason I place them with the output vent above the or the intake vent above the output vent as it's as you see here in this picture is I didn't want the intake vent to be drawing in moist air that would be coming out of the output vent so tr I that's why I put the outtake or the out intake vent above the uh, above the output vent in this picture here. So here's the unit itself, the uh, ventilation unit installed on the inside of the high tunnel, and they are about forty to forty-five pounds. And so you need help 
when you hang one of these units onto the plywood. There's a rail that gets screwed onto the plywood, and then the uh, ventilation unit actually hangs on that rail and gets screwed to that rail. And once the ventilation unit is in place and the vent hoods are in place, you can then start running the, the duct work. So that's what you see in this second photo here in this slide is the duct work is coming off the top of the, the intake and output portals on top of the heat recovery ventilator and running to the respective uh, vent hoods. And you see in the, in the middle of that picture is the heat exchanger cube. That's the aluminum heat exchanger that the air gets transferred through in order to transfer the warm or transfer the heat from the warm air, uh, inside air to the cool outside air as it's being drawn in. A note about um, how to install the flex duct. This is insulated flex duct that's run to the vent hoods. And the reason it's insulated running to the vent hoods is you're drawing in cold air from the outside and you don't want condensation to form on those on the cold air intake. And uh, the other reason is uh, the warm air is being drawn in is being taken in taken to the uh, inside of the tunnel and you don't want to lose the heat from that warm air to the out to the outside so these need to be insulated and the way you attach these to the back of the vent hoods is you peel back the insulation insulation from the flex duct slide the flex duct over the back of the vent, vent hood duct work and then use duct tape to air seal that. It's probably the uh, only place on your farm where you're actually be using duct tape in the way it's supposed to be used on duct work. And uh, that creates a nice air seal. And then you it's not shown here, but you pull the insulation back over the, uh, the duct work and put a zip tie around it so it's nice and tight and you have an air sealed insulated uh, connection there. So this shows the return air ductwork. This does not have to be insulated because this is warm air now being blown back into the tunnel. This shows I ran that return air all the way to the other end of the tunnel. I zip tied it to the top purlin or the ridge purlin of the tunnel and ran it over to the far end and angled it down and just let it blow air back into that end of the tunnel. And the purpose for this was to create some airflow in the tunnel. Uh, I was drawing air from the side of the tunnel that the heat recovery ventilator was on, and I was returning air to the opposite end of the tunnel in hopes of getting a small amount of circulation of the air inside the tunnel. That's the reason that, that, that I did it that way. Then there's a control, uh, wall-mounted control unit for the, for the heat recovery ventilator. This is a low voltage control panel that runs with a low voltage wire back up to the heat recovery ventilator. And it gives you basic control of the unit. It's a touch screen and uh, you can control the fan speed and you can also set uh, different times for the ventilator to kick on and off using this control screen. So there's also, um, because this unit pulls moist air from the tunnel and transfers the heat from that to the incoming air, uh, condensation does form. So there's a condensate line that allows the moisture to run out through a tube in the bottom of the unit. And now it's best to run this tube to the outside of the high tunnel uh, and let that water, keep that water outside the high tunnel when it does form. Uh, there is a chance in the winter, though, that that tube could freeze in really cold weather. Um, so for this project, we set the unit to shut off at low 
at lower temperatures. So anytime it got below 35 degrees in the high tunnel, the unit would not run, so there would be no condensate to deal with. Um, I think that uh, if it could run um, without freezing at lower temperatures, I think it would have done a lot. It would have done a lot more running. If we'd allowed it to do that, it might have impacted the results of this uh, of this project to have the heat recovery ventilator running at lower temperatures. Uh, but as it was, we wanted to avoid that problem of freezing condensate, so we had it shut down under 35 degrees. Uh, they also make defrosting units that would be a consideration for if we did more experimenting with this, I would consider using a defrosting unit so that the condensate line freezing wouldn't be a problem in the condensate line. They cost a bit more money and they use a little more energy, but I think it would be worth trying. Uh, you could also run this condensate line to a bucket inside the high tunnel and uh, keep a lid on the bucket, and then you'd have to manage that by, uh, you know, emptying the bucket every every so often as it filled. But those are some options for getting rid of the condensate. We used a simple external temperature control uh, thermostat uh, that we put in line so that we, when it got below 35 degrees in the high tunnel, it would shut the unit down. That was for the condensate uh, freezing problem, uh, to avoid that problem rather. And we taped all of our plug connections, mainly to keep moisture out of them, but also to make sure that none of them were pulled apart uh, at any time during the during the winter, uh, that would kind of shut all the equipment down if if one of these plugs came on unplugged. So we made sure we taped all of those. Then we set up. Once the unit was installed, we we set up collection. Uh, point or data collection points. And we use these easy log USB data loggers. They were placed in each high tunnel and outside of the high tunnels. And they were placed in the center of the tunnels on the inside of uh, the baseboard of the tunnels. And that's a very humid location. In hindsight, we might have gotten better data if we moved them away from the edge of the tunnel to the, to the center of the tunnel. Um, but also to protect the outside data logger that was placed outside the tunnels, we attached it to a ground stake and we placed a five gallon pail over, <clears throat> over the top of it to protect it. Again, in hindsight, this may not have been the best setup. Uh, it kind of created a, a space that got warmer underneath the bucket on sunny days. And I think it, it uh, recorded some higher temperatures than the actual outside uh, temperatures were, which didn't affect the uh, experiment too much, didn't affect the project too much, but I would, I would just take note that that, um, that setup wasn't uh, the best for data collection on the outside of the high tunnels. So here we see a picture of the upper high tunnel at the beginning of the project, the start of the project, and like I said, we took soil samples from each of the tunnels and the soils were amended according to the test so that each tunnel started with uh, the soil in good condition to grow the crops that we were trying to grow. And the crops we were growing were Asian greens, two beds of Asian greens, and they were planted direct seeded on the left hand side in the beds on the left side of the tunnel here and spinach, which was transplanted from the greenhouse on the right-hand side of the tunnel here. The, the right-hand two beds were both in spinach. We did the same thing in the lower high tunnel. And on the same date, you can see that it had a little bit of a head start, though. The Asian greens are already up, and the spinach has been transplanted for a few days and is already taking taking hold. So the lower high tunnel did have a couple of days head start, which uh, I'm going to talk about that as a possible um, and how it possibly affected the results when we get to the results section here in a little bit. Again, the upper high tunnel, uh, about halfway through the project, you can see in mid-December, 
the Asian greens on the left have already started to be harvested. And on the right-hand side, the spinach is ready, to, almost ready to harvest. Now, this tunnel, the upper high tunnel that we used as a control was kept closed for the entire winter. So they didn't do any ventilating in this tunnel for the entire winter. And I was hoping at the beginning of the project that I would find a control tunnel that was being ventilated some. And because uh, I wanted to compare uh, the lower high tunnel with the ventilation, the heat recovery ventilation unit in it to a tunnel that was actually being managed like most Northeast growers manage their high tunnels in the wintertime, which is they open them up and, and ventilate them some in order to control moisture. But uh, New Morning Farm manages their tunnel slightly differently and they, they kept it closed for the entire season. So that may have affected some of the, some of the results as well. Because if the vented, if, if it was vented, then the average daily temperature in this upper high tunnel uh, may have been lower than what was actually recorded and what we're going to see here when I show you the data in a, in a few minutes. And uh, we also had a very warm fall and winter over the 2015-2016 winter season here in the Northeast. So um, that may have also affected results uh, to some extent. Now, here's the last set of pictures, the lower high tunnel. Um, actually, this is the lower high tunnel in the middle of December, and you can see that it's it's ready to go on the Asian greens. They're ready to pick, and the spinach has already been harvested some. And then toward the end of the experiment or toward the end of the project here in February of 2016, the upper high tunnel is... Um, is ready to um, harvest for the last time and they're starting to get ready to um, get this tunnel in shape for su summer crops. Uh, so shortly after this, toward the end of February, beginning of March, the project ended and we stopped collecting data because they were they had ended their winter growing in these tunnels. And the lower high tunnel at the same date in February shows that it had been harvested for the last time. So some of the data that uh, we collected, actually all of the data we collected, we put into graphs um, that you can see here. And to answer the first question that I set out to, to answer and see if the heat exchanger actually would control the moisture in the high tunnel or the relative humidity in the high tunnel, we, we graph that on the top of this graph in the three lines on the top of this graph. And you can see that the solid pink line, which represents the lower high tunnel that had the heat recovery ventilator in it, actually drops below the upper high tunnel relative humidity quite a bit throughout the season. Uh, so it definitely was lower the relative humidity was lowered in, in the tunnel with the heat recovery ventilator in it. They, it did not reach our threshold of 85% relative humidity. As you can see, uh, the average relative humidity that's listed on the bottom of this slide was only 94%. 94.8% in the lower high tunnel. It was 99.5% in the upper high tunnel. So um, we had a difference there, uh, you know, a 5% difference there in relative humidity. So it did lower it, but it didn't reach the threshold that we were shooting for. The other thing we can see from this graph is the comparison of the temperatures throughout the throughout the growing project or the, the growing season over the course of the, the winter. And those are charted on the blue lines toward the bottom of the graph. And you can see that the two solid lines from the upper high tunnel and lower high tunnel are almost identical. And there was not much temperature difference to speak of uh, from the two tunnels. Uh, average The average daily temperature was only a few... Um, uh, very few uh, points lower in the lower high tunnel, almost too, too little to mention. So there was almost no temperature difference whatsoever in the two tunnels, which um, answered my second question, whether, whether it would actually 
increase the average daily temperature over the control tunnel. It did not. So the next thing, the next graph to show you here is the dew point. And this wasn't something I was originally uh, going to look at uh, when setting up the project, but the data loggers that I used in the project automatically calculated the dew point. Uh, and it might be, I, I thought it might be an important thing to consider uh, because it's the, it is the temperature at which condensation will form on the leaves of the plants, which creates a more ideal condition for foliar diseases. So in a winter high tunnel growing situation, the lower the dew point, uh, the less time there is for condensation to form because the temperatures drop to low enough, uh, to a low enough point uh, to cool the plants down to dew point and condensation will start to form. And you can see here the average dew point in the lower high tunnel was 40.3 compared to 42.2 .2 in the upper high tunnel. And this is only about a two point, uh, you know, two degree difference. And that's not much, but it does reflect the lower relative humidity in the lower high tunnel and the effect that it had on dew point. And it means that on average, the crops in the lower high tunnel would have to be two degrees cooler than the crops in the upper high tunnel in order for condensation to form on the leaves. And based on the uh, small average temperature difference observed in the two tunnels, this new dew, dew point data, uh, there would have to be fewer opportunities for condensation to form on crops in the lower high tunnel um, based on this data. So that might have been something that happened. Uh, the difference may be too small to have been significant or to impact disease control, but there was a difference there that we observed. And here's this is just another way to look at the data. Um, it shows direct comparisons of the two high tunnels, uh, the upper high tunnel, which is the control tunnel, and the lower high tunnel that had the heat recovery ventilation installed. And it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship line on the graphs offers a uh, reference. So if the data points are on the line, then the high tunnels are performing exactly the same. And when comparing the relative humidity here in the first graph that you see, the lower high tunnel had lower humidity as evidenced by the, uh, the numerous data points above the one-to-one -one relationship line. And this trend is consistent with the, the use of the heat recovery ventilation system. The comparison of temperature in the second graph or the middle graph reveals that the trend that the uh, upper high tunnel was cooler than the lower high tunnel with numerous points below the one-to-one uh, -one relationship line with an exception at the lower temperatures where the upper high tunnel is a little bit warmer than the lower high tunnel. And this result was pretty unexpected, but considering that the heat recovery ventilation system was controlled by an external thermostat that shut it down below 35 degrees uh, to keep the condensate line from freezing, if you take that into consideration, uh, it's not very surprising that we we don't see the heat recovery ventilation system performing at the lower temperatures because it was shut down. So uh, dew point in the in the last graph here on the far right uh, that followed a similar trend to the temperature because it's based uh, it's tied in with the temperatures. Uh, it's figured on the temperature and uh, the upper high tunnel had a higher dew point at lower temperatures and it had a slightly lower dew point at higher temperatures. So this is just another way to, to look at the data and inter make a few interpretations of it. So I'll say with the harvest data right up front that it was somewhat incomplete. We had, we missed in the harvest data, we missed a few days in the upper high tunnel uh, harvest records. Uh, so, but it was only a few days and I decided to put the um, information we had at hand, at least in graph form so that we could do a comparison here. And you can see that there was quite a bit of more production in the lower high tunnel. Uh, 
the lower high tunnel Asian greens outproduced the upper high tunnel greens by uh, quite a bit there. 80 pounds uh, in the upper high tunnel compared to 247 in the in the lower high tunnel. And the same thing with spinach. We had 520 pounds of spinach in the lower high tunnel compared to uh, 309 pounds in the upper high tunnel. Now this difference in uh, this difference in production translated into over $4,500 worth of increased sales out of the lower high tunnel. Now, this is, like I said, this is skewed a little bit high because of the missing data from the upper high tunnel. Um, but it was only a few days that were missing. And um, even if we were to give this a handicap, you're still seeing quite a bit more production in the lower high tunnel. Um, whether this can be attributed to the new ventilation equipment uh, is not entirely clear. The lower high tunnel, like I said, did have a couple of days extra growing time. It was planted a few days earlier than the upper high tunnel. Um, I don't, we don't know if that would have made all of this difference. Um, but the only other difference between the two tunnels was the heat recovery ventilation system and the lower humidity. Uh, and we, um, we see this much increase. If it can be contributed to the ventilation system, then these, this system would have paid for itself several times over just in the production of one year uh, based on these harvest records. Now, the last thing I wanted to look at in trying to figure about how cost effective these units are, um, com you know, compared to, in other words, comparing what value they add to the crop um, and comparing that to what money is, is laid out in order to install one of these units and run one of these units. I wanted to take a look at the energy usage in order to determine that. They're very low amperage. The unit that I installed drew uh, 1.4 amps and that amounted to, you know, amounts to 168 watts when it's running. And I estimated that it would run about half the time for the five month period that it was installed and running for this project, which amounts to 303 kilowatt hours of, of usage. And based on a 12 cent kilowatt hour, that comes to $37 to run the unit for five months. So even if it was running steadily for the five month period, uh, we would still be in the uh, 70 to $80 range of, of how much it would cost to run one of these units. Uh, so it easily pays for the electric usage in one year. If you can attribute the increased production to, to this unit, it'll pay for itself and its energy use easily in one year. So some of the conclusions and lessons learned, I, I talked about some of these as we went through the, the webinar, but the unit itself was fairly easy to install. It was not very costly compared to the type of production numbers that are coming out of these high tunnels. It did lower the relative humidity, but it did not increase average daily temperature inside the high tunnel compared to the control tunnel. So, uh, and it didn't hit our 85% uh, mark uh, that we were shooting for, 85% uh, relative humidity or lower. Uh, we did not achieve that. Uh, it did, if you attribute it if you attribute the increased harvest to the ventilation system, it did increase the harvest and it paid for the ventilator. So uh, it did pay for itself pretty easily in one year if we can attribute those, those extra harvest numbers to, to the ventilator. I would use in further experimenting, if I were to do this again, I would go with a traditionally vented tunnel, like I said, one that was opened up during the winter, at least some of the time um, in order, I would use that as a control tunnel uh, rather than one that was closed down the whole time. Uh, that would give us a better comparison to how 
growers in the Northeast really uh, manage their tunnels currently. I would also install a larger ventilation system. Uh, I would move up to that 200 CFM unit for the tunnels size that we were dealing with in this in this experiment, uh, the 20 by 96, I would go up to a 200 CFM unit and see see if that made a larger difference. See if we could get down to that 85% humidity uh, or lower. And I would uh, also experiment with a unit that had a defroster on it so that I wouldn't have to shut the unit down uh, when, the, when the cold weather came. I would want that unit to be able to run uh, during colder weather. So we got the full benefit from it. And I would say the biggest conclusion from this pilot project would be that we need more experimentation on a wider, wider range of farms in order to see if this idea really, um, really does make sense. So that is all I have for you today. Um, that's the information about the project and, uh, and about the results of the project. There will be, like I said, a publication that uh, coincides with this uh, webinar and talks about the entire project and the results of the project. And uh, that will be available on our ATRA website as well as this webinar, where this webinar will be archived, as I stated in the beginning. So I uh, thank you for your time. I, I thank you for your attention. And thanks for joining us today.